So I'm delighted to welcome you all to um, this seminar on poverty activism in Northern Ireland. I'm Anne-Marie Gray and I'm co-director of ARC based at Ulster University. And this event is part of a series of events that we're having for ARC's 20th anniversary this year. And we, we really wanted to do something um, on poverty for a number of reasons, um, particularly because Northern Ireland has been in many respects, a trailblazer for poverty activism, not just in recent years, but going back over many years. And it is quite fortuitous, although it wasn't planned, that uh, this is also the time when a new anti-poverty strategy is being developed, which is absolutely brilliant news. So I think it's very timely then to reflect on, you know, to reflect on the challenges um, and some of those very, very persistent challenges that we have faced. Uh, over the decades, but also maybe some of the learning from activism and some of the opportunities going into the future. So uh, we've got a number of really distinguished panelists today, and I'm absolutely delighted to be to introduce them. Just a few um, housekeeping arrangements uh, first. Um, we've got four speakers and we're going to hear from them first. Um, while they're speaking, if you've if you have questions that come to mind, if you would put those in the chat box just as you go along, uh, there'll also be an opportunity when the presentations are finished um, for, to put questions into the chat box and we'll be asking the panelists you know, to reflect on some of the questions that, that uh, you're posing. Um, we um, are going to start um, with someone who has been involved in poverty activism in Northern Ireland for such a long time. Um, that she was one person that we were really quite determined to have for this panel. And that is Brona Hines. And I'm sure Brona's name, uh, Brona's not a stranger to most of you uh, here today. Brona is a senior associate uh, currently with D Democracy, an organization which she founded in 2000. And since 2013, she has been working to support women and civil society in the Syrian conflict. And throughout her career, Brona has worked actively to promote social justice. She led Gingerbread Northern Ireland from 1981 to 91. She was director of Oxfam from 1990 to 1992. And she was involved in the setting up of the Northern Ireland Anti-Poverty Network. In 2014, she co-authored Women on the Edge, an analysis of the impact of the financial crisis in Northern Ireland uh, on, on women in, in particularly. And uh, since 2014, she's, she has again been relentless in her um, pursuit of social justice uh, uh, around the issue of poverty and particularly women's poverty. So Brona, I'm just going to hand over to you and allow you to take the floor now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anne-Marie. Um, uh, uh, it's good to be speaking to everyone, even if it is online. So thank you very much for, for coming to this. Um, actually, this invitation from Anne-Marie um, allowed me to, um, uh, to uh, think about uh, my history in relation to poverty activism, because I hadn't actually described it in that way. So I'm just going to go through a run through the various things I've been involved when ju just to set the scene. And I'm sorry to say that the issues that were pertinent then, uh, and I'm talking about the 1970s, are still pertinent today, as you'll see from what, I, what I'm saying. My first job actually brought me into Citizens Advice Bureau, where we were, I was the information officer, and we were supporting an um, uh, advice bureau throughout Northern Ireland. And a lot of the issues that, that they came up with were obviously uh, poverty related um, uh, and exclusion related. And then I moved on to um, work on the first European anti-poverty program in Ireland rather than Northern Ireland at that time, because in that first program, um, there was, as I understand it, no program in Northern Ireland. It took the second European anti-poverty program for the UK to get actively involved. But I was working at that time in combat poverty where we were working and actually so seeing the link between social exclusion and poverty. So we were focused on developing projects, either community development projects in urban and rural areas or welfare rights projects. And that went from the very south of County Cork and somewhere like Castletown Bear up to um, somewhere that has often been left out, which is Leitrim, as well as the west in Connemara. 
Mara, as well as areas in Dublin City and Cork City, and with specific excluded groups, such as, such as travellers. Um, the other thing around in the 70s was, and it's right to name it, is, is the work of women and the activism that started the Northern Ireland Women's Rights Movement. Many of those who are involved in the civil rights movement, but felt specifically that women's voices needed to be heard. And I'm reminded uh, that the women's rights movement opened the first um, women's center uh, for women to come to uh, get advice, a women's education project to come for support in rape, uh, to run the first International Women's Day um, um, uh, marches. And also the area that I was extremely interested from the, from the early 70s, even when I was a student, was childcare campaigns. And one of the things that we did was we set up a rent a crash with the um, uh, to particularly focused on education uh, with the with the University of Ulster and also with the trade union movement so that women could actually be active participants and trade unionists at party conferences uh, and things and begin to put their issues. For example, in those days, um, men were arguing for overtime pay and everything else. And women's voices were not being heard, and actually the basic pay and the, as we know from the gender pay gap, but back gap, women were very underpaid. So it was really important that women were supported to be able to go to conferences, and and actually get their issues on the agenda and, and prioritise. That took me to the 1980s uh, to Gingerbread, and again it was a mixture of which is Gender Red is a wonderful organization and I was very privileged to, to, to be working there. A mixture of um, self-help peer support groups, uh, welfare rights centers and welfare campaigns. So again, it was that mixture of empowerment and assisting people with advice on their information and, and their rights uh, and then running that into campaigns. Actually, what we tried to do um, is always run a campaign around the, um, the annual supposedly benefit uplift, which at times could be like very marginal, could be like 26 pence a week or something like that, very, very marginal. So two, two things come to my mind uh, that we did to get some attention on the media. Uh, one year we ran a, a campaign where we actually uh, uh, had a, a kind of a display of items uh, each of which would be worth the value of, of the benefit uplift, uh, whether it was a tin of beans or one sock, couldn't even afford a pair of socks and, and got a lot of media attention on that. Uh, another year, actually, and this was a great year, the, the, the I think a, a good campaign, the uplift in benefit payment was so miserly that um, uh, it was worth the price of a toilet roll so we actually got 26 toilet rolls to represent one of each of the gingerbread groups in Northern Ireland, boxed them up and sent them to, to Downing Street uh, just to, to, make, to make the point. Um, the other areas I think we need to think about uh, from the 1980s, um, and I just want to mention it in passing, were the dreadful herd principles on political vetting. Um, and where there were great organizations like the Workers' Education Association and others working in West Belfast with groups, for example, out of Conway Mill, uh, before Conway Mill was developed into the wonderful center it is today. It was kind of, you know, it was a rough and ready center and, and organization for working there, building community-based education, welfare rights, various support. And with the herd principles come in and political vetting, um, all of those groups were threatened to have their money uh, stopped uh, and withdrawn for their work if they continued to work in, in, in that area um, um, because they saw everybody associated with that time uh, as related to Sinn Féin and the IRA. And to give them their due organisations like the Work Workers' Education Association refused to be intimidated out of it. And even though they got their, their money um, partly uh, cut, they continued uh, working uh, in West Belfast um, at that time. In the 1980s, there were lots of activity uh, to establish pan-European uh, networks, many linked to the poverty agenda. Let me run through a couple of them. And, and uh, Amri was right, Northern Ireland was a trailblazer in a number of these. Um, 
some of you may have heard of the European Women's Lobby, a great pan-European women's rights organization. But before that, there was a small group called the European Network of Women, which focused on trying to lobby to get the European Women's Lobby involved and ran a number of events across Europe. It was very small. Um, I, they, um, someone that I had worked with in Dublin in combat poverty um, suggested my name because they wanted to uh, have a special position for Northern Ireland at that time uh, and recognize that Northern Ireland was in conflict and different. So uh, I was lucky to be involved in that and to be involved with them across Europe. But one of the first things that we did is run a women's poverty conference. I think probably the first the first one, and even before the European Anti-Poverty Network was, was set up, the first one um, in Europe. Uh, and in preparation for that, we wanted to consult with women in the areas where we were. So again, this was the first. We organized uh, quite a large women's poverty conference in Northern Ireland in St. Thomas's Hall, if I recall, on the Lisburn Road. And what was also unique about it, because we reached out particularly to excluded groups, and to my mind, it was the first conference that involved quite a number of traveller women, as well as settled women uh, working in the same conference to try and map out the issues that were important for women and poverty in Northern Ireland before we went to that conference. Um, and we brought a, a delegation of women uh, to that conference, including traveller women, to that conference um, in Brussels. And um, we prepared um, uh, an outcome statement, uh, not pre-prepared because I argued very strongly against that, but we worked um, through the night based on the outcome of all the discussions of women across Europe to prepare an outcome statement, which was presented at the, at the final conference day to the European uh, Commission. And, and that was some of the things that I think were the foundation basis of the European Women's Lobby. At that time, it's important to mention, as well as the European Women's Lobby then, um, uh, two other key organizations. There was an organization called FIANSA, which is the European Federation of Housing Organizations working with the homeless. When the European Commission was very keen to develop pan-European nations to actually bring the social dimension into the European agenda, moved away from the old econ European economic community. Um, uh, a lot of people uh, began to bring their issues and their specific issues to the table. So we spoke about women, then Fianza, the organization of working with homeless, and there were uh, key Irish people involved in the establishment of that federation. And then there was the European Anti-Poverty Network. And Northern Ireland was instrumentally involved in setting up the Anti-Poverty Network. Uh, in Brussels, I was elected on to the small steering group of about um, eight, eight people. And we developed all the statutes to set it up officially and legally within um, the European Union. Um, we actually went to other member states to encourage them to set up national networks. Of course, I was very keen that we would have a proactive network uh, in Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Anti-Poverty Network, which we established at that time. And then uh, the, the Southern, the Republic of Ireland Anti-Poverty Network. And then uh, I remember being in Wales and England in terms of meetings to help them establish networks as well. Uh, and I was pleased that after my year on the steering committee, when we set it up, it was finally launched in 1989, uh, Quinton Oliver, who at that time was director of the Northern Ireland Council for Voluntary Action, became the first president of the officially set up European Anti-Poverty Network. And following him into some of those positions were key activists from the south of Ireland um, as well. That took us to the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of getting voices heard was actually um, to get um, uh, more support for the voluntary sector and community development in Northern Ireland. And in that time, Thatcher had a policy uh, that um, uh, about voluntary actions that they were only important to the extent that they served a role in the economic or political agenda, the conservative political agenda. So the voluntary sector in, in the UK were very averse uh, to um, getting engaged with it. But we thought, you know, they don't understand Northern Ireland very well. So um, uh, we in NICFA at the time, I was chair of NICFA and Quinton was the director, got involved in discussions and, and negotiations around that. And that ended up with the strategy for the support of the voluntary sector and community development in Northern Ireland, 
uh, which uh, Lord Patrick Mayhew, who was Secretary of State, uh, uh, eventually uh, signed, signed up on. Then we go through the time with the targeting social need agenda, uh, making Belfast work, and, and all of those that were began to be set up by government to develop um, um, uh, work around uh, poverty. Uh, as you know, um, TSN uh, was a Conservative Party policy initiative designed to tackle significant differences um, uh, in the socioeconomic pro uh, profiles of the Catholic and Protestant communities. Um, but there was great engagement of the voluntary sector in this programme. And to, to be honest, in those early days, the voluntary sector had good relationships, particularly with, with civil servants in the Department of Health. And, and we often worked in partnership to try and develop the policies. So around um, and, and point out the gaps in areas like targeting social needs. So it's really good to hear about the, the way that the strategies are being developed in partnership now around poverty and around gender. And, and around 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 areas, um, the the other thing I think it's important to mention is because the community and voluntary sector needed to bring the voice of the excluded uh, uh, to the table, and um, we needed to find some way of funding them. And in fact, even though we had that policy, official policy, and targeting on on, so, on the voluntary sector and community development, we need some funding. So. Um, uh, Liz Law, who I think is listening in today, and Quinton and I worked very hard on negotiating with government around the building, the first, before peace programme, the European Union Building Sustainable Development Programme. I think anybody who's here from those days will remand, rem uh, maybe remember my instruction to the voluntary sector not to go on holidays during a particular summer because as usual government had done the consultation period over the summer period and we wanted to make sure that we had the utmost consultation and that we got as many of the voluntary sector issues uh, defined and integrated into the program uh, as possible and um, I came up with this concept of community infrastructure and therefore, one of the things that we designed into that program was the concept of building community infrastructure. And we had already discussed with our partners in the Department of Health that this was one way that we could actually bring money in to support the strategy for the support of the voluntary sector and, and community development in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, and in fact, it was interesting because in those days, though not much was made of it, um, we wrote in and actually physically wrote in the um the role of the voluntary sector in the north south chapter on the island of ireland something uh, um, to keep in mind moving forward in this uh, brexit uh, context then we can go through to the period of setting up the northern ireland women's european platform and um, women taking part in the beijing uh, platform for action in 1997 but maybe particularly focus on a conference that we held a north south conference in the u.s ambassador's residence in phoenix park which was also supported by the European Union. And why is that important? And another meeting shortly after that, uh, which I was involved in as director of the Ulster People's College and chair of NIWEP, along with Avila Kamari from the Community Foundation of Northern Ireland, was that we were trying to have women's voices heard as we were moving towards possible peace negotiations so that uh, women's voices would be heard both in decision making and in economic and social de development. So the programme for that conference and for another meeting with uh, the Euro European Commission representatives was around um, women's um, asks of uh, investment and e in economic and social uh, development as well as their voices being heard. Um, just uh, quickly to finish off, um, uh, we mentioned the... the um, the uh, Amri mentioned uh, Northern Ireland Com economy, women in the edge, and that piece of work um, looked at the impact of the financial crisis on women, including lone parents, migrant women, young women and older women we focused in, but also particular issues, pensions, welfare reform, debt and credit, housing and energy debt. And we did it in such a way um, so that we outlined the issues and the challenges, what women were experiencing. And then we developed um, a summary of policy recommendations in each of those areas so they could be picked up and worked on. Um, I'm sorry to say that, as you can see from 1975, you can see from that work in 2014, you can see from the great work that the Women's Policy Group and the WRDA has done on the feminist recovery plan around COVID, where women were not specifically included in any of the um, um, 
uh, consultative bodies and, and emergency bodies around COVID and had to argue for a voice there. And you can see from all the issues laid out in the feminist recovery plan that we have not uh, really solved that issues about ensuring that all excluded voices are included, uh, that they are taken account of. And we are still dealing with the issues, as we can see from welfare reform, and we can see from 1975 through welfare reform through today, um, about the poor position that, that people are in. We can see that issues that keep including excluding people and keeping the poor still need to be addressed in terms of childcare. Remember, raised in 1975, raised again in the, in the 2000s, continuously raised. And here we go in the feminist recovery plan, having to put it on the table, because as we can see from the pandemic, the in, not having childcare, people were not able to actually uh, go to essential work, et cetera, but yet it isn't in the mainstream of thinking. So I just want to leave on a positive note that I think two of the really great mobilizing movements that we have around now that are uh, linking activism to policy is the Women's Policy Group, which is an open group for those in uh, any organization that wants to be engaged in actually looking at policy from a women's agenda perspective, and the Women's Budget Group, which is now um, established with a worker to actually address the whole issues about the whole cycle of dep economic deprivation of women, but also to look at issues like uh, gender budgeting and hopefully turn that around. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Brona. I think that's just provided a really excellent uh, context uh, for this seminar. And, you know, really we're reminded of the way in which activists in uh, Northern Ireland have always strategically looked outside to, and particularly to, to engage with Europe. And I think it's really timely as well that you're reminding us of the importance of the, the voices of those experiencing uh, poverty being being held. And I know that's something that the um, anti-poverty, the, the panel working on the anti-poverty strategy has been extremely concerned about. So we're going to move on now to our second speaker, uh, Martina McCauley. And Martina has a PhD in sociology from Queen's University Belfast. And she's been working as research and evaluation coordinator at Housing Rights since 2018. Uh, while it's there, I think Martina's work is, is known to many of us now. She has authored three really significant pieces of research focusing on the experience of low-income uh, households living in the private sector in Northern Ireland, including a very recent report focusing on the impact of COVID. And again, you know, as, as, as Brona mentioned, you know, housing was and continues to be one of the things that makes people, the cost of housing, extremely vulnerable to severe and persistent, persistent poverty. So Martina, you're very welcome. Thanks very much. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm just gonna share my screen, which I hope works as well. Um, okay, so uh, as I say, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, since I graduated in 2018, as you said, I've been working for Housing Rights. It's Northern Ireland's leading independent provider of specialist housing advice. And for over 50 years, they've been helping people to find and keep a home through uh, their advice and advocacy work. Uh, we have a very talented team of advisors and specialist case workers, many of whom are solicitors, um, and we work on behalf of our clients. So I'm um, part of the policy team at Housing Rights and our policy work is based on the views and experiences of the people who contact us for advice and that's where I come in. My research is used internally and externally to inform the policy work that we do and it can be anything from back of the envelope calculations to providing stats and other data to support our policy positions uh, to full reports and I always provide an executive summary for those because I know that very few people will read long detailed reports so the executive summary is essential. But the full report's always there for anyone who wants to dive a bit deeper into the research. Um, but even those small pieces of informal research can have a really big impact. Um, for example, recently with one family who was facing uh, an £800 per month impact of the benefit cap loophole. 
and I used the information on the poverty level in Northern Ireland as it's currently calculated to show that they were almost 60% below the poverty level as a result of the benefit cap, which was specifically related to their housing situation. They were in temporary accommodation, which had been fully covered and not subject to the benefit cap. And when they got a social tenancy, which was great, but they were then subject to the benefit cap. So highlighting uh, kind of anomalies like that is very important for us. Um, and my part is providing the evidence then to support a wider conversation on welfare reforms. But the prevailing narrative in Northern Ireland has been that housing is affordable, especially when compared to the Republic of Ireland or to Great Britain. And it does look that way if you only look at averages and if you ignore incomes, there's no real problem. There's no poverty caused by paying for housing. So I've been challenging that narrative since coming to work for Housing Rights, using evidence from a range of sources, not least of all our clients' experiences. So one of the major policy priorities is for Housing Rights is concerned with affordability for low-income households living in the private rented sector. And I'm going to focus on that part of our work today. The private rented sector has grown substantially as a proportion of households in Northern Ireland. In 1983, it was around 8%, and by 2016, 18% of households were living in the private sector and it's equal in size now to the social sector and it's a housing and increasing proportion of low income households, including those who've not been able to access social housing because they don't have enough points or they're on the waiting list for such a long time, which currently stands at almost 440,000 households. So when I started at Housing Rights, there was a sense from our advisors and caseworkers that affordability in the private rented sector was a major issue uh, for people who contacted us for advice. So the first piece of research I did was on housing benefit in the private sector, which is uh, based on the local housing allowance. And I was able to access a lot of data from the housing executive, bless them. Uh, the data spanned 10 years. It was every rental advert rental property that was advertised over 10 years um, and that enabled me to show the impact of the reduction in generosity as well as the reduction in real terms of the support for housing costs which was available to private tenants. So unlike most social tenants, housing benefit doesn't necessarily cover the full cost of the rent uh, for private tenants. Rather, it's based on local market rents, with the policy supposedly allowing those in receipt of full housing benefit, or UC, universal credit, help with housing costs, to access the cheapest 30% of market properties. But when I explored the data, the rate set for the local housing allowance were covering only 10% of advertised properties. Because of the changes that were brought about as a result of welfare reforms, the local housing allowance has become increasingly out of whack with the 30th percentile. So we were able to use this evidence to show that the same issues which were highlighted by other housing charities like Shelter and Crisis and the Chartered Institute of Housing, which were focused on GB, um, were also affecting households in Northern Ireland. And this was the first time that this had been systematically laid out for government to see. So in response to the pandemic, then the LHA rate was raised to the 30th percentile, which was great news. But we knew that the average shortfall, which private rented sector tenants were facing, was £28 per week in 2019. And I was able to look at the data then to show that the average uplift from raising the local housing allowance rates was £10 per week. So we can see that there's still some way to go to bridge that gap faced by private tenants who rely on support for their housing costs. So in the next major piece of research that I undertook, I went on to look at some of the difficulties faced by low income households in accessing and sustaining tenancies in the private rented sector, which was a largely qualitative piece of research which was funded by the housing executive. And that just highlighted the issues that our clients were facing when trying to access accommodation in the private rented sector, including having to find a deposit and at least one month's rent in advance, which was a major barrier for a lot of our clients. But they also faced issues in sustaining tenancies. So it's one thing to be able to get into a property, but if you can't afford to pay the rent and you end up in arrears, there's a good chance that you'll end up being evicted and presenting as homeless again. But looking at the cost of living in the private rented sector was also important. So it's not just about being able to afford to pay the rent, 
but many of our clients who have affordability issues are also impacted by the standard of accommodation they can get access to, often finding that the property is impossible to heat or just too expensive to maintain a reasonable degree of comfort because of old or inefficient heating systems. And to be clear, our current fitness standard in the private rented sector means that a property would meet the fitness standard so long as it has a plug into which a heater could be plugged into. So the latest research, which is hot off the presses, uh, it's just uh, been uploaded to our website, is on the impact of COVID-19 on private renters in Northern Ireland. And this research used evidence from our case records um, over four months earlier this year and shows that our private rented, private rented sector clients were disproportionately affected by the issues arising from the pandemic and lockdown. They're caught in the perfect storm of low incomes, often as a result of job losses, the furlough scheme or reduced hours, also job insecurity and tenure insecurity. And almost half of those who had affordability issues were fearful of being evicted as a result of the arrears which they were accruing. A high proportion of those affected worked in hospitality or were self-employed, and many people were applying for benefits for the first time in their lives, and clients reported finding the system difficult to navigate. So particular elements of the system, such as the five-week wait for first UC payment, were difficult to cope with. Students who contacted housing rights were particularly affected by layoffs and reduced hours and income at work, many of whom relied on that income from part-time work to pay for their rent, with little or no alternative support available to them. The support provided by, for uh, many employees and the self-employed was indeed a lifeline, but it's important to remember that it didn't reach everyone affected. So we hope that the research will shine a light on systemic issues affecting low-income private renters as more households join the ranks of those needing support for their housing costs as a result of the pandemic. And to bring attention to the point that we didn't all experience the pandemic in the same way, we were not all affected in the same way, and perhaps more importantly, we didn't all go into this pandemic in an equal position. We might all be in the same storm, but we're definitely not in the same boat. The pandemic and the economic shock which has followed and which is likely to continue for some time has served to expose the fault lines in the housing system, but there's perhaps the potential to use the experience and the knowledge gained to aim to address those issues which have always been there, but which have come into sharp focus as a result of the turmoil we've been through this year. Government need evidence for any proposed changes and that's where we come in at Housing Rights. Our policy team work really hard to provide evidence to support our policy asks. So that helps us to make a difference. We're not just going to officials and to government with changes we'd like to see for our clients, but we're going to them with evidence from our clients, either in the form of numbers or stories. At the end of the day, it's all telling stories, whether it's numbers or, or clients' experiences. And um, whilst the research is written uh, you know, so that it stands alone. Every uh, piece of research stands alone, but um, they're all accompanied by a policy paper. And those will have a specific set of asks included. And our next focus piece of research will concern the potential to discharge the homelessness duty to the private rented sector. And it builds on all of the previous research that we've done. The policy briefing uh, serves to set the stage for that, so to speak. Um, it's a really good resource. It's on our website at the minute. But the research will explore our cases in depth over a five-year period. So I'm looking forward to getting stuck into that. And there will be a policy paper with specific asks to accompany that research. It should be published in March. So our case workers advocate on behalf of our clients, often highlighting systemic issues which can then be challenged and changed. Our policy team engage with other organisations and directly with the Minister and with politicians to provide evidence to inform the discussions and influence the outcome for our clients, as well as collaborating with other organisations to lobby on behalf of those people who often don't have a voice. In terms of our impact, we've been really encouraged by the Minister's statement on housing just a couple of weeks ago and hope that there'll be major changes brought, brought in which will benefit low-income households in the private rented sector. So thank you, that's me, I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much, uh, Martina. And I think, you know, the, the evidence base that you've talked about is so important, you know, to having that direct impact on policy and, you know, particularly that work around the shortfall between the, the cost of housing and housing benefit. You know, I remember in the 1990s, Gingerbread publishing work showing that that was beginning to be one of the biggest concerns 
for lone parents, but there was no really systematic analysis of that. And of course, you know, the problem has increased now, so it's, it's really uh, fantastic and important work. And uh, Martina has mentioned, of course, the new challenges that are, are facing people experiencing poverty, particularly um, during the pandemic. And our next speaker has been very much involved in analysing, but also making people aware just of the impact of that and has for some time been working on issues relating to universal credit. So Kira Fitzpatrick is a lecturer in, in the School of Law at Ulster University. She researches the UK social security system and social economic rights. Um, many of you will know Kira from her previous work at Law Centre NI. Um, as if she's not busy enough, Kira is also involved in the UCUS project, and that's a group of people who are claiming universal credit, who uh, share their experiences and recommendations for policy change. So the voice of people experiencing poverty is very much uh, centre stage there. Kira also volunteers in her local community of North Belfast with St Vincent de Paul. And she's very much an advocate for social justice, and she definitely uses every opportunity to educate people on the inadequacy of the social security system. So I'm sure you'll take that opportunity now, Kira. Thank you so much, Amory. And I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, and among such other esteemed panelists, um, Bruna and Martina have been really inspired by your talk. And actually, Bruna, I don't know if you can see this, but my, this came from my granny's house and it's a wee magazine from 1981 called Falls in Focus. And it shows a woman and her baby here, or a woman and her wee girl at the Conway Mill. And it says the group was accused of improving the standing of furthering aims of paramilitaries and grants from the Action for Community Employment Scheme were withdrawn without an opportunity for hearing, appeal or presentation of evidence. So yeah, that just, that brought that to mind. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm definitely uh, quite early on in my activism journey. And um, it really started for me when I began my PhD research in 2014 um, under the supervision of Professor Grania McKeever who is also a researcher in social security law um, and for example sits on the social security advisory committee as the Northern Ireland member. So I really got knee deep in it from then um, and also meeting brilliant uh, colleagues in uh, the School of Social Policy as well who got me uh, involved in lots of brilliant things like the Social Policy Associ Association Conference for a couple of years and yeah, I just really steeped myself in it and I started reading about the social security system from its um, beginnings, from beverage, um, right through until the introduction of the Welfare Reform Act. And my PhD research actually focused on um, the impact that or the implications of political rhetoric and um, you know, the developing political rhetoric from 1979 and how it actually influenced legislation and social security legislation. So I looked through all the Hansard debates and um, select committee debates and House of Lord debates all the way back from 1974 when Keith Joseph was the Secretary of State um, for uh, so health and social security and uh, right through to the Welfare Reform Act and was completely astonished by the impact that rhetoric has had on the development of legislation, particularly as Martina very um, adeptly outlined there, the fact that much of modern policy, particularly around universal credit is based on assumption and rhetoric and actually not on evidence-based policy making. And I can't really put into words the impact that that is having on the ground now it is absolutely devastating. Um, and, you know, COVID-19 has brought that into sh to sharp focus. Um, so yes, I, I graduated from my PhD in um, July, 2019. Um, I had a wee baby in between time. So uh, I actually finished my PhD in 2018. Um, and I started work at the Law Centre at that time. And the Law Centre really give me the practical view of what is happening in terms of the social security system. 
um, and how people are being really punished by measures such as the five week wait um, and the transfer from DLA to PIP. And I suppose the dehumanization process of going through um, the benefit appeal system. So working in the law centre gave me the opportunity to meet the most wonderful and inspirational um, bunch of people who are all working in the community and voluntary sector at the minute. People like Martina in Housing Rights, um, colleagues in NICVA, in the Equality Coalition, in Employers for Child Care, um, just right across um, the community sector in Northern Ireland who are working on these important issues. And the big issue for us um, at the time and before I um, left the Law Centre was the fact that the Northern Ireland mitigations package was coming to an end. And it was due to come to an end in March 2020. And of course, we had no executive at the time either. So we were getting really, really worried that people were literally going to fall over a cliff edge because they were going to be no longer protected by um, the mitigation uh, measures that have been brought into place. So some examples of the mitigation measures are that people that were transferring from uh, DLA to PIP would be protected and um, people would be protected from the benefit cap. And um, well, there is a loophole there that'll come to in a minute. People would be protected from the bedroom tax um, and people would be able to uh, access emergency funding for example from the contingency fund to support them through the five-week wait which unfortunately has hasn't been happening very well either but anyway those mitigation um, protections have been a lifeline for many and we were really conscious that they were coming to an end thankfully so we formed the cliff edge coalition and um, so at the law center and housing rights were kind of the um creators of that coalition and it brings together over a hundred organizations in Northern Ireland from the community and voluntary sector and together we are campaigning to ensure um, that those protections for uh, claimants um, are maintained and um, permanently maintained for as long as we are in this situation um, where people here are being bitten so hard by um, welfare reform measures Thankfully, the executive uh, was reformed in January 2020, and we got confirmation that the mitigation package would continue. But we are now in the strange situation whereby it is continuing as it was introduced in November 2016. So we are seeing lots of new challenges associated with universal credit that the working group who um, developed the mitigation package couldn't have foreseen back in 16. Um, you know, for example, universal credit only started rolling out in Northern Ireland in September 2017. So issues such as the five week wait, as the two child limit, um, and as the difficult issues that private rented, the private rented sector are facing really haven't been accounted for in the current package. Also, we have got a couple of loopholes there that urgently need closed. So for example, in order for a family to be able to access protection from the benefit cap, they had to be in receipt of a qualifying benefit in November 2016 in order to access that mitigation payment. Um, and also you can only access the mitigation payment once. So if there is a change in circumstances, for example, um, a family separation, um, you will lose access to that mitigation package. And we can really see this biting um, lone parents in particular who are lone parents with larger families. Um, I know that Martina described that particular case that she is working on that really, you know, shows the impact of the benefit cap, 800 pounds per month. That is just horrendous. I know that the Law Centre had a case whereby a single mother of six children, she is working part-time, but has two children with complex needs, and she is losing a thousand pounds a month due to the benefit cap. They are left with about, um, less than about 250 pounds per week after rent to account for all of their bills, food and other needs. Um, so the Northern Ireland Executive, the Department for Communities can close that cap urgently 
can close the loophole urgently. You know, it is a devolved issue. And that's something that the Cliff Edge Coalition has really been pushing for, as well as the bedroom tax mitigation as well, whereby if you um, move from one social rented sector property to another, and you are still found to be over occupying that property, you will also lose access to the bedroom tax mitigation. So as I say, there, the executive and the assembly have the power to close those loopholes now. And it has been really frustrating that they continue to allow um, us to remain in this limbo where they just continue to extend the current mitigation package again and again um, and do not close uh, those loopholes. It is particularly frustrating because um, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission research, they did economic modelling on, you know, how much it would cost to close the benefit cap loophole, for example, and, and for a cost of three million pounds, um, the Department for Communities could protect 2000 families from the benefit cap. And the average loss to a family who's impacted by the benefit cap is £3,500 per year. Um, but this is obviously in certain cases where there are larger families, much higher than that. And I'm finding it really hard at the moment to stomach the fact that we see the Department for Communities putting big investment into the likes of food aid. Um, so I learned this week that the Department Department for Communities is going to invest a further 3.5 million into delivering food parcels across Northern Ireland. Um, and that narrative around um, really institutionalizing food aid as part of the welfare state um, really bothers me, um, particularly when they have an opportunity to ensure that families can directly access um, finance rather than food. Um, and it's also really bothered me how we're seeing this narrative of businesses um, and those who are self-employed. I know it hasn't been very good, um, the actual administration of the grants. It's been terrible actually, and a lot of people have been let down by that and are, and are going through unspeakable suffering. But they are able to access direct finance, whereby those people who are living, those people who are unemployed, who are out of work, through no fault of their own, um, are having to rely on charity and on food aid. Um, because the contingency fund, which was supposed to be a lifeline for those people going through the five week wait, it is a, an, a, a grant, so it doesn't have to be repaid, but nobody knows about it. The Department for Communities have not done a good job in informing people about the availability of the contingency fund. Any of the people who I have supported just in my local community of North Belfast have never heard of the contingency fund. They haven't been offered it. They have always been offered the advance payment, which um, really skyrockets their debt. Even um, as a, a colleague of mine in the um, community and voluntary sector, Siobhan Harding, who women, works for the Women's Support Network outlined, even the word contingency fund, people really don't know what that even means. So it does come down to the accessibility of it. Um, but honestly, it remains unpaid, that, or it remains unspent. So there's still money in that pot. Um, and that, that's really, really bothering me uh, um, and other colleagues on the Cliff Edge Coalition. The implications of the advance payment and universal credit means that people are really struggling to access discretionary, the discretionary support fund. So the discretionary support fund replaces the social fund and community care grants. But as the Northern Ireland Audit Office highlighted in 2019, it is highly restrictive and um, payments from the discretionary support grant are much less than we would have seen from the um, social fund. People cannot get access to um, emergency funding for essentials such as white goods, uh, washing machines, fridges and, and furniture. And we are seeing, you know, lots and lots of people turning to charities like St Vincent de Paul, Salvation Army, Storehouse, other other church charities on a weekly basis because they cannot afford these basics. 
I haven't even gone into the two child limit. It's, you know, people are losing over 2,000 a month because of the two child, or sorry, 2,000 pounds, um, in excess of 2,700 pounds per year due to the two child limit as well. And, you know, an academic colleague, Jonathan Bradshaw, um, who has been a child rights, a child poverty activist for a long, long time, described it as the most abhorrent social policy that has been ever introduced. And, you know, I would completely agree with him. It was introduced because uh, under the auspices of Tory rhetoric, when they explained that, um, you know, they wanted uh, women and families living in poverty to have to make the same family planning decisions as those taxpayers in terms of how many children that they could afford to have. But this is a misnomer for many reasons, for many reasons. But the two main reasons are that um, two thirds of families that are impacted actually have somebody in work. And secondly, um, many of the families that are impacted now um, could not ever have foreseen being impacted by a global pandemic where they would lose their jobs um, immediately. And many of those people um, already have more than two children. And this has, you know, the impact of the two child limit and the benefit cap has been for significant, has been significant rises in child poverty here in Northern Ireland. The latest figures are frightening. We see, um, child poverty, our relative child poverty go up by two percentage points and absolute child poverty go up by around six percentage points in the last year. So it really is shocking. Um, and there is a, a, ter a terrible, um, we are facing terrible and long lasting implications of um, COVID-19 um, in terms of poverty. I know I've probably overran how long I can talk. So I'm just going to finish off by saying that um, what has really struck me is the lack of power that um, people who are living in low income households have in society. Um, the people who I am helping in my local community, those people in UCOS, they are being dragged from pillar to post trying to get any kind of support or indeed trying to get people in power to listen to them. Um, I was telling Anne-Marie, I was lamenting with Anne-Marie last week about a particular case, a particular woman in the community um, who had a housing issue. And she didn't understand, you know, that she could go to her local MLA. She didn't know who her local MLA was. She didn't understand that she could find support from housing rights. She was ringing, she was in the social rented sector, so she was just ringing the housing executive constantly. So, um, and she was getting nowhere, absolutely nowhere. She'd been out of her property for 12 weeks before the issue was sorted. Basically sofa surfing between family members. She had also the trauma of losing her job as a cleaner at the outset of the pandemic. Um, and she had to go through the five week wait for universal credit. So the combination of her housing issue, of losing her job, of winning for universal credit, literally plunged her into a state of destitution. And it's going to be, and it continues to be very difficult for her to get out of that situation. She has now got a new property, but she remains in 500 pounds rent arrears due to the five week wait. She cannot get access to discretionary support. And so she is currently residing in an unfurnished flat. St Vincent de Paul were able to help with a bed for her, but it is in no way um, a reasonable place for her to live. So I thought I would just finish off with this quote from another academic, John B. Wilson, who sadly passed away earlier, earlier this year. Um, and he wrote really eloquently on what participation means. He said that participation is not just a matter of doing what other people conventionally do, like culture and sport. In its widest and fullest sense, it is having the personal capabilities, the required resources to take full part in the way in which a country or a local area is run and to be treated as a full equal. I'm getting emotional, my goodness, in the democratic process of doing so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Kira, I think you have just so incredibly explained to us the importance of hearing about that lived experience. It's so powerful. And you know, on John V. Wilson's, you know, when his obituary was in the paper and they were talking about that. And the other thing which he said was that everybody should have the right to spend some of their money foolishly. And that just reminded me so much on you know how you started your talk about the damaging impact of rhetoric, which suggests otherwise, you know, that poor people have to live differently than the rest of us. And you've raised really challenging questions, I think, about food aid, and I hope that's some of the things that will be picked up on in the chat later. And also, actually, about the fact that whilst our devolved administration is constrained in some respects, they have scope to take a lot of action. So really powerful points. So thank you very much, Kira. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. And I just actually wanted to say that I'm so happy that there are groups like you see us and the minister is engaging with them and they are engaging in a lot of kind of direct conversations with politicians at the minute. And, you know, having their voices at the forefront is just so, so important because that lived experience is really integral to change in policy. Yes, and particularly when we're thinking about the anti-poverty strategy as well. So our final speaker today is evidence that um, there are plenty of young people who are stepping up to take forward campaigns for change. Ryan Shaw is currently an intern at Youth Action Northern Ireland. He's working on the One Small Step campaign to break down social barriers and encourage young people to be activists. Uh, Ryan himself has come through Youth Action as a volunteer and alongside his internship, he's also a student on the level four certificate in youth studies. During Ryan's time at Youth Action, he's worked on a project with PPR and he was a member of the Young People's Right to Welfare Group. So thanks very much, Ryan, for agreeing to do this. Delighted you're here. Um, thank you so much. Um, just waiting on my presentation to load here, but I just want to say, um, you know, it's uh, been really powerful listening to Brona, Martina and Kira. And Kira, I also want to try and say um, you should never apologize for being emotional, to be honest. I think that's what I think that's what is needed. And a, a lot of people, especially those in power, should get emotional because what you said there about um, the sort of pot of money and stuff like that, and there being money in that pot, it got me remind it reminded me of I came across a bit of news story, if you will, earlier this week about uh, a twelve year old in West Belfast who had emptied his piggy bank, and with all the money he had saved up, he used that money to go and gather food that was able to feed thirty nine families for three meals a day for thirty nine families for three days. You know that 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 young young, young man could have got himself anything he wanted, he could have got himself a new PS5, you know, but he said, he looked and saw what was going on and he said, no, I need to do something about that. And to be honest, I was getting emotional as well, listening to you speak and stuff, because it, it does get me angry as well that there are people in power that, you know, have that, have the power to do something, but they can't, but there's a young man, 12 years of age in West Belfast, empty his money bank and gave it to others. So, I just want to say thank you all um, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, so my name is Ryan Shaw and I'm here to give some insight and share my lived experience into how poverty and the culture of benefits affect young people. I'm aware I'm not the first person to do so, but I would hope that I am one of the last. Too, e too often it's been e too easy for people, especially those in power, to look away from a news story or to just simply close their laptop. But for some of the ones that are living it, day in and day out, they can't. It is a darkness that shrouds them, but I hope today can be a day of change that brings light to their lives again. My own experiences with the welfare system began after I left the army in England. My parents had pretty much abandoned me after years of abuse. And so I had to return to Northern Ireland while they stayed in Scotland. My grandparents over here were less than eager to help support me, so I signed on the job seekers for the first of many times over the years. I managed to come off it several times, but jobs I took on were either cut short or I was let go. 
having to sign on every two weeks felt humiliating. To go and have someone joke you and stereotype you as being lazy or lacking ambitions is one of the worst things I have been through. And remember, I had been in the army and had a traumatic, abusive childhood. I tried to look for work and felt that I'd done well in interviews, but no job offer emerged as someone always seemed to have more experience. How is anyone meant to have experience if you need experience to do the job in the first place? This went on for months where I felt low and my mental health took a huge hit. My bulimia got worse. It affected my sleeping, my stress. The list goes on to the point where I was in a dark place. I had to borrow money off friends just in order to help my partner put food on the table and she was already working two jobs. But I managed to pull myself together as I had done so many times before. But when a china plate is broken and then put back together, the cracks can still show. I was worried I would be judged from my cracks rather than what I could do or achieve. This changed when I got the chance to be involved with Youth Action and their work with PPR Rights to Welfare. So uniting and encouraging lobbying and campaigning, such as the PPR Halloween protest, where I, along with others, protested the likes of Capita and City Hall in Belfast, and awards were given out by the devil to congratulate these establishments on the inhumane treatment and suffering they had caused others. A survey was carried out to see what the young people were going through, to have their story told, to see what was going on with their experiences of the welfare system and the likes of universal credit. This, this survey was called the Right to Welfare, Right to Work survey. 72 young people completed it. Most of the ones that completed it had said that they'd been trying to look for work for over six months to two years. After a certain time, if they weren't able to find work, they were forced to go on a program called Steps to Success. Steps to Success is an employment program the Jobs and Benefit offices run, and most people do not have a choice but to go on this, even though most do not get a job from it, or even if they do the job last less than six months, and then they're back to square one. 60% had mentioned about their money being stopped, reduced, or delayed. When asked their reasons for were they, what the reasons were given to them for this, some had said they were simply for missing an appointment, or a decision was made on their claim without their knowledge or consent, or the system had changed, so from when job seekers changed to universal credit. But what shocked me the most and what angers me the most is that 40% said that not a reason was given. Their money was stopped, their source of income was stopped, their way of feeding themselves or if their families were stopped with no reason. What also upset me, but did not surprise me sadly, was 85% of those surveyed reported impact on their mental health. 85%. At the start of the year uh, in January, uh, when the Northern Irish Assembly got back together, as many of us know, Boris Johnson was here, and I was there that day, and I managed to raise to Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, the finding from these surveys, and tried to get some questions. I raised to Boris Johnson how our survey we carried out had highlighted and shown the inhumane treatment that young people are suffering. And I reported back to him about how 85% had said about their mental health being impacted and that this was surely leading to the high suicide rates that Northern Ireland have. I said to Boris Johnson that Northern Ireland has the highest suicide rates in the UK and the UK the highest in Europe. I asked him for his response on what his views on that were and what was going to be done about it. He was too quick to try and jump straight to, you know, the fact being that nothing much had been done simply because of it breaking it down to we didn't have a government because of the divide and a green and orange issue. And he promised a certain amount of money that was going to be given to help, you know, benefits and also help the mental health services. I can't remember the percentage off the top of my head, but I don't think it would surprise many to turn around and say it is, it is nowhere near what he has promised. So finally, to wrap up, I realise that a lot of, uh, there's a saying that history has its eyes on us. And most of this talk has been about what has happened. Now I'd like to conclude with how we can have our eye on the future. 
We have a responsibility, not just as workers in our different fields, but as human beings to do something to help young people by leading them into changing a broken system. The system is broken as how dare there be a system where people can only hold the power of life and death over another human being, because that is what is happening when someone can not only control the means to the likes of food and shelter, but in further damage to mental health when life can already be difficult with all the challenges it presents. This year alone has showed us this. No one, no one could have foresaw the effects of COVID-19 COVID coming and the effects it had. The audacity as well to have power or what is perceived as power, as has been mentioned so many times today, but not use it how it should be used. Using the power of support, supporting life, supporting jobs, and not just in highlighting current jobs in supermarkets or factories, but the support to help them find the jobs that can fulfill their lives. I myself growing up hurt, different, practically isolated most of the time, when one person took the time to talk to me, to listen to me, to guide me at different stages when I was at my lowest, like my girlfriend, my friends, and friends' colleagues throughout my time in youth work. Well, here I am being able to speak to you all today. These times showed me not only the power support can have, but how to empower others, not by judging, not by asking someone to tick a box or to fill in forms every two weeks or to sit across from a desk and judge them, and that's it. No. The greatest power that we all have today and for others not let, not being able to earn for others that aren't here today we have the power the greatest power of all the power of humanity and compassion the power to seek change in the sense of creating new areas or pathways into work that may have seemed impossible to get into at first glance it will not be easy but we can achieve an outcome by working together to not just fix but rather improve the system so young people can rest easy, not worrying about their next meal, their shelter, their security, their families and friends, their individual lives and mental health. But most importantly of all, they should not and never accept judgment of their cracks, but instead encouragement of what they can achieve. This is time for us to take a stand, to draw the line and say no more to these injustices and look at a growing alternative models of influence for young people by teaching them how to be future leaders through the likes of peer research and campaign programs and usher in a brand new future. I believe that together we can improve and save lives. That compassion, belief and strength we have deep down in all of us, once united, will provide the best benefit for everyone young and old, and that is community. Thank you. Ryan, uh, thank you so much. I think you're absolutely right to draw attention to power being, you know, a, a, a really important theme that's emerged in the discussions today. And, you know, also, you know, it's really important that you, you're reminding us that, you know, these values of humanity, compassion and dignity are, are, should absolutely be at the core of what we do when we set out to address poverty and to improve social security. So thank you all, um, all of you for your contribution. It's been really fantastic and so much food for thought.